With shelters overflowing with migrants and refugees, the Greek government is growing anxious. Migration Minister Yanis Mouzalas says they need relief. At the moment we have 7,000 people ready to be relocated and no answers from the European Union member states which would be obliged to accept them. Therefore, we ask that this gap is covered. The EU is obliged to accept migrants and refugees under a plan devised last year. The plan aims to move 160,000 new arrivals from the frontline states of Italy and Greece to other EU countries. But so far, fewer than 4,000 have been resettled. Muzala says many EU members are dragging their feet. The European Union member states are responding with a delay which does not correspond to our need to cover the positions that we have requested. And all the while the shelters continue to fill, Greece says it's looking for answers and soon. Keeping up with the news at all, you know there is a massive migration happening from the Islamic world into Europe and the United States for that matter through the refugee program. Now, we usually see migration being driven by politics and poverty, but there's another driver here which is the doctrine of jihad in Islam. How does this work? Well, let's start with timekeeping and the calendar. In Islam, they don't use the same calendar we do. They use a, when they mark a year, it has AH after it in the year of the Hijrah migration. And why do they do this? Well, you see, it's very simple. You would think that Islamic calendar would start with the birth of Muhammad or the date of the revelation of the Quran, but no. Instead, the Islamic calendar starts with what brought it success, migration. You see, Muhammad preached the religion of Islam for 13 years in Mecca and persuaded 150 Arabs to become Muslim. Not a very high success rate. When he was driven out of Mecca and went to Medina, he became a jihadist and a warlord. And this brought him enormous success. After 10 years of being in Medina, practicing the art of jihad, he was ruler of all of Arabia and every Arab in Arabia was a Muslim. You see, it was migration which led to the success of Islam. And therefore, that's the reason the calendar is keyed to migration, because that's what brought it success. Now, in the past, Muslims didn't migrate much. They stayed in Islamic lands. But today, through the pressure of population growth and poverty, they're leaving, and of course, war. We help to destabilize the governments, and so therefore, they're coming to those who actually destabilized their governments. It used to be that Muslims were supposed to stay in Islamic lands because that's where they could fully practice their Islam, where the Sharia ruled. But now then, they're coming to America, and a new twist has been put on the migration doctrine. You can come to the land of the Paffer, the non-Muslim, but you must as much as possible live in Muslim enclaves and obey as much of the Sharia as possible. Now, in the past, there was one argument that Muslims should not take any part of the Jahiliya doctrine, ignorant doctrine of the Kafir, and to stay totally outside, to build a wall around the ghetto. But the Muslim Brotherhood has advocated a new argument. No. The immigrants are to start taking over the process of politics, stay in enclaves as much as they can, and then enter into politics where they start to influence the schools, laws, civil rights laws, halal food, and other such things. What they're doing here is practicing the jihad of dollars and the jihad of the pen and the jihad of speech. That is, they're persuading Americans that, you know, Islam is just the best thing of all. So they're quite political in their arguments and their presence in front of our legislatures. Let me point out to this something so that it will be clear to you. There are many, many Buddhist immigrants who've come to America. What was the last time you saw a rally where they were protesting for Buddhist rights? What was the last time you, the Buddhist had advocates or lobbyists in the legislature? They don't at all. You see, all of this, always the pressure we're having on our civil rights and all their aspects of how to live in America from the Muslims, this is all part of jihad, jihad of the pen, and jihad of speech, and jihad of money. Jihad of money, as an example, is setting up centers within universities which strictly mouth the position of the Sharia. Now, the part of life that they cannot lead as a pure Muslim in America or Europe is covered by a principle in Sharia law. If you, necessity overcomes obligation. If you're supposed to do something as a Muslim, but you cannot because you're living in a Kafir land, 
then it is okay because the necessity of living is more important than a Sharia rule. So remember this as well. Under jihad, any rule of the Sharia can be broken. So what we think of as politics and poverty has a new driver in American, and that is the politics of jihad, migration as jihad. We're going to see a lot more of it. What are we going to do? Do we want to sustain our civilization? Then how are we going to deal with this problem? And why do we keep bringing in more and more of it? Think about all this. Ε, έτσι κι αλλιώς ακούσαμε και η Νέα Δημοκρατία ότι συμφωνεί στο, στα βασικά άρθρα που αφορούν τα προσφυγόπουλα όπως λέτε για τα σχολεία οπότε θα λογοδοτήσουν στον ελληνικό λαό και οι κύριοι της Νέας Δημοκρατίας που από το Σεπτέμβρη θα κατακλειστούν τα ελληνικά σχολεία με πακιστανάκια, αυγανάκια και 80 διαφορετικών εθνικοτήτων παιδιά και θα πάνε και, πίσω... Και με συγχωρείτε, αλλά μπορείτε να λέτε ότι θέλετε Σας να παρακαλώ. διαστρεβλώνετε την ψήφο της Σας Νέας Δημοκρατίας. Δεν Η Νέα Δημοκρατία Καρακόπουλε. και συνολικά ναι. καταψήφισε το νομοσχέδιο και ναι. το συγκεκριμένο άρθρο είπαμε ότι επειδή ομοιάζει με λευκή επιταγή το καταψηφίζουμε. Ποιο καταψηφίσατε, το 20 με 25. Σας παρακαλώ. Μη... Με... Σας παρακαλώ. Άρθρο... Κύριε Χαρακόπουλε, τα... ο... αυτό που κάνει είναι καταγεγραμμένο. Για να καταλάβουν και οι αυτοί που μας ακούνε τι καταψηφίζει η Νέα Δημοκρατία. Κύριε Λιόπουλε, κύριε Λιόπουλε, κύριε Λιόπουλε. Πείτε την τοποθέτησή σα, ακούσα τον κύριο Χαρακόπουλο, είναι καταγεγραμμένα στα πρακτικά, συνεχίστε ε, την πρακ... τοποθέτησή σα. Για τα πρακτικά κύριε Πρόεδρε, Αυτό. να μας πει η Νέα Δημοκρατία, αφού θέλει ο κύριος Χαρακόπουλος να παραχωρήσω το λίγο από το χρόνο μου. Δεν είναι θέμα παραχωρήσεις. Να μας πει ο κύριος Χαρακόπουλος, γιατί εγώ δεν κατάλαβα, εγώ κατάλαβα ότι η Νέα Δημοκρατία υπερψηφίζει το να δημιουργηθούν τμήματα ειδικά ε. για προσφυγόπουλα, όπως λέτε, στα ελληνικά σχολεία. Ε. Καταψηφίζεται ή υπερψηφίζεται κατα... κύριε Ό, Φαντα. Για τα κύριε Χαρακόπουλε, αυτά που αφορούν σας πα... κύριε τη διαπολιτισμική εκπαίδευση, κύριε Χαρακόπουλε, συμφωνείτε τέλο πάντων, αφήστε τα άρθρα Κύριε Ηλιόπουλε, συμφωνείτε δε... να δημιουργηθούν 850 τμήματα προσφυγόπουλων στα ελληνικά σχολεία. Κύριε Ηλιόπουλε, κύριε Χαρακόπουλε, είστε πολύ έμπειρο. Κύριε, ε, κύριε Ηλιόπουλε, δεν είναι τρόπο συζήτηση στην Επιτροπή αυτό. Έχετε μία άποψη που μπορεί να μην καταλάβατε τι είπε ο κύριο Χαρακόπουλο. Δεν πειράζει, προχωρήστε την άποψή σα. Εγώ την άποψή μου την είπα. Ωραία, πολύ ωραία. Και εγώ αυτό. πιστεύω λοιπόν, αφού δεν θέλει ο κύριο Χαρακόπουλο να Απαντήσει, αφού είναι τόσο έμπειρο και προσπαθεί να ξεκινήσει. Δεν τον αφήνω από εγώ να απαντήσει. Αφού δεν τον αφήνω την... εγώ να απαντήσει. Έχει τόσο μεγάλη εμπειρία και προσπαθεί να κοροϊδέψει του ψηφοφόρου τη Νέα Δημοκρατία και κακώ πετάει. Αφού παραχωρείτε το, χω... το χρόνο, αγαπητέ συνάδελφοι. Δεν είναι θέμα. Ωραία, απαντήστε, συμφωνείτε. Να... λοιπόν ότι δεν ψηφίζουμε το άρθρο το τελευταίο που δίνει η λευκή επιταγή στον Υπουργό να ρυθμίσει τα θέματα αυτά. Είπαμε ότι η κυβέρνηση από τη στιγμή που έχει τόσο ζωηρό ενδιαφέρον θα έπρεπε να είναι προετοιμασμένη φέρνοντας συγκεκριμένες ρυθμίσεις να τις συζητήσουμε, να περάσει από τη βάση της διαβούλευσης και να αποφανθούμε από αυτόν. Δεν την ψηφίσαμε είπαμε και εν το συνόλο δεν ψηφίσαμε το Ωραία, πιστεύει. συμφωνείτε λοιπόν, λοιπόν, αν θέλετε για το ακροατήριο συμφωνείτε, σας λοιπόν, να λέτε ότι σας θέλετε, ακροατήριο, πείτε ό,τι θέλετε απαντήστε κύριε Χαρακόπουλε για το δικό σας ακροατήριο συμφωνείτε να δημιουργηθούν 850 τμήματα σε όλη την Ελλάδα για τους αλλοδαπούς συμφωνείτε ή διαφωνείτε σας παρακαλώ να μην απαντηθεί καμία τέτοια ερώτηση λοιπόν κύριε πρόεδρε οι γονείς που θα πάνε τα ελληνόπλα σταματήστε κύριε να μιλήσω οι γονείς λοιπόν λέω αύριο θα τοποθετηθώ και επί των άρθρων και επί των συνόλων αύριο συνολικά λέω όμως ότι οι γονείς που θα πάνε τα παιδιά τους από το Σεπτέμβριο στο σχολείο και θα δουν να κατακλείζονται τα σχολεία με αυτά τα παιδιά θα λογοδοτήσουν οι κύριοι της Νέας Δημοκρατίας και του ΣΥΡΙΖΑ σε αυτούς τους γονείς. Ήμουνα πάρα πολύ ξεκάθαρος. Ο κύριος Χαρακόπουλος έχοντας μάθει όλα αυτά τα χρόνια να ξεγλιστρά και αυτός και το κόμμα Σας του... παρακαλώ μην είστε προσωπικές. Δεν, α... δεν υπάρχουν προσωπικές εκπαιδεύσεις. Ο κύριος Χαρακόπουλος πετάχτηκε. Εγώ απευθύνθηκα στη Νέα Δημοκρατία. Ο κύριος Χαρακόπουλος θύχτηκε. Πετάχτηκε. Θα λογοδοτήσει από Σεπτέμβρη. Ωραία, Είναι τόσο ωραία, απλό. Ωραία. Και θα πάει στους... Μισό λεπτό να ολοκληρώσω. Και θα πάει λοιπόν... Θα πάνε εκπρόσωποι της Νέας Δημοκρατίας στα σχολεία και θα τους λένε εμείς δεν ψηφίσαμε, ψηφίσαμε. Ίσως ψηφίζαμε, κάναμε, εράναμε. Λοιπόν, αυτά θα τα πούνε στους γονείς. Εδώ μέσα ο κ. Χαρακόπουλος ας λέει τις αεροστολογίες του. Γιατί δεν μας είπε τελικά. Συμφωνεί με τα 850 τμήματα αλλοδαπούν, αλλοδαπούν θα κατακλείσουν την Ελλάδα ή όχι. Συμφωνεί λοιπόν. Και ας λέει τις αερολογίες του, θα τις κρίνει ο ελληνικός λαός.
Πάντω, να σα υπενθυμίσω ότι υπάρχουν και γονεί που θεωρούν πλούτο στην κοινωνία μα μια τέτοια κατάσταση. Αυτά, κύριε Πρόεδρε, τα περί είναι... πλούτου. Πείτε τα τώρα που θα ξεκινήσουν τα σχολεία. Πείτε, θεωρούμε πλούτο που θα έρθουν τα Αφγανάκια και τα Πακιστανάκια στο σχολείο. Μήπω όμω είναι. Μήπω είναι. Μήπω είναι. Πείτε έξω και πείτε τα. Ότι Μήπω είναι πλούτο σε μια κοινωνία. Σε... Για σκεφτείτε πλούτο, το εξή. Πού, πού δημιουργούν πλούτο αυτά τα παιδιά, κύριε Πρόεδρε. Πλούτο. Και να τα λέμε τα πράγματα με το όνομά του. Φαίνεται πίσω. Φαίνεται δεν ξέρετε τη λέξη. Πλούτο και τι σημαίνει. Ναι, ναι, εντάξει. Εσεί που το ξέρετε, λοιπόν, πείτε στου γονεί που θα πηγαίνουν πίσω τα παιδιά του στην εκπαιδευτική διαδικασία, γιατί αυτά τα παιδιά, όπω είπε και ένα υπουργό, δεν θυμάμαι ποιο από του υπουργού, ότι αυτά τα παιδιά δεν έχουν πάει. Ο κύριο. Δεν θυμάμαι ποιο το είπε, ότι αυτά τα παιδιά δεν έχουν πάει ποτέ στο σχολείο και ίσω χρειαστεί να του δείξουμε και τι σημαίνει σχολείο, να, τι σημαίνει πειθαρχία και τι σημαίνει σχολείο. Σε αυτό το επίπεδο θα γυρίσουν τα Ελληνόπουλα για να συνδυαστούν και να συνεπάρχουν με αυτά τα παιδιά. Εσεί πείτε μου λοιπόν ποιο είναι ο πλούτο, τι θα κερδίσει ένα Ελληνόπουλο από τη συνύπαρξή του με ένα Πακιστανάκι και ένα Αυγανάκι. Για πείτε μου εσεί που ξέρετε τη λέξη πλούτο, τι σημαίνει. Πολλά θα έλεγα. Θα κερδίσουν πολλά, ε. Εντάξει. Μπορεί Πάρα το δικό σα παιδί να κερδίσει πολλά. Τα δικά μου Δυστυχ... παιδιά δεν θα κερδίσουν πολλά. Δυστυχώ είναι μεγάλα τα δικά μου, οι δάλο θα κερδίζανε πολλά. Θα κερδίσανε, ναι. Εντάξει, κάντε κανένα εγγόνι τότε να κερδίσει. Τι να σα ευχαριστώ κύριε Λιόπολ, τελειώσατε. Θα, μας, θα σας κρίνει όλους, θα σας κρίνει ο ελληνικός λαός, θα σας κρίνει. Όταν λέτε ότι τα αυγανάκια θα δημιουργήσουν πλούτο στα ελληνικά σχολεία, θα σας κρίνουν, ναι. Ε? Και θα δείτε σας... τι ντομάτες θα φάτε και εσείς κοινοδημοκράτες. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ. Αντελείο. Στην κατεσχήνη λοιπόν της ιστορίας, σας παραδίδουμε, δεν είπαμε τυχαία. Ότι όταν έρθει στα πράγματα η Χρυσή Αυγή, όταν υπάρχει μια πραγματική ελληνική κυβέρνηση στην Ελλάδα, τέτοιου παράγοντε σαν το Μουζάλα και σαν όλου αυτού που ξεπουλάνε την Ελλάδα, θα του απελάσουμε στα Σκόπια. Γιατί αυτή πρέπει να είναι η τύχη κάθε προδότη. Διότι έχει χυθεί αίμα εδώ και αιώνε, όχι μόνο για την εθνική μα κυριαρχία, όχι μόνο για το όνομα τη Μακεδονία, όχι μόνο για να μην είναι η Ελλάδα Ισλαμική χώρα. 400 χρόνια αγωνιστήκαμε, χύθηκαν ποτάμι αίματο για να φύγουν οι Ισλαμιστέ, να φύγουν οι Μουσουλμάνοι. Να φύγει η Μισελίνο από την Ελλάδα, να φύγουν αυτά τα μισητά σύμβολα και αυτή η μισητή θρησκεία από τη χώρα μα. Χύθηκαν ποτάμι αίματο που δεν σεβαστήκατε. Και σήμερα προσπαθείτε μέσα σε ελάχιστο χρόνο να Ισλαμοποιήσετε την πατρίδα μα, να ξεπουλήσετε τα εθνικά μα δίκαια, να κάνετε την Ελλάδα Ισλαμική χώρα, να εκχωρήσετε εθνική κυριαρχία, να εκχωρήσετε το όνομα τη Μακεδονία. Δεν θα περάσει η εθνική προδοσία. Δεν θα περάσει και δεσμεύεται για αυτό ο λαϊκό σύνδεσμο Χρυσή Αυγή. Είδα ότι Προηγουμένως είχε επικρατήσει μάλιστα και ένας πανικός, είχε κινητοποιηθεί ο φρούραρχος στα παρασκήνια για να μην γίνουν επεισόδια, να μην επιτηθούμε, να μην επιτεθούμε, με συγχωρείτε, στον εν λόγω παράγοντα που διέπραξε αυτά τα έσχη. Λοιπόν, παρότι πολλοί πολίτες μου το λένε και εμένα προσωπικά και σε άλλους βουλευτές από το Λαϊκό Σύνδεσμο ότι πρέπει αυτούς οι οποίοι κάνουν αυτά τα έσχη, πρέπει να τους ταράξετε στο ξύλο μια μέρα. Λοιπόν, εμεί επιλέγουμε. Έλα, κάτσε κάτω, κάτσε κάτω και με διακόπτη. Κάτσε κάτω και με διακόπτη. Βρήκε ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ συνήγορα από τη Νέα Δημοκρατία. Ορίστε, α γελάσουμε. Ο ΣΥΡΙΖΑ βρήκε συνήγορα από τη Νέα Δημοκρατία. Λοιπόν, κύριε Πρόεδρε, κύριε Πρόεδρε, τι θα γίνει τώρα. Θα ανέχομαι τον κάθε ανόητο, θα ανέχομαι τον κάθε άθλιο να με διακόπτη. Τον κάθε ξεφτυλισμένο να με διακόπτη. Λοιπόν, συνεχίζω λοιπόν. Θα σα ταράξουμε όχι στο ξύλο, όπω λένε οι πολίτε, αλλά στην ομιμότητα. Διότι εδώ έχουν υπάρξει πολύ συγκεκριμένε. Συγκεκριμένα εγκλήματα, πάρα πολύ συγκεκριμένα εγκλήματα με το λαθρό μεταλλαστευτικό εκ μέρους αυτών που έχουν διοριστεί και πάρει σαν τους υπουργούς. Κακουργηματική κατάχρηση εξουσίας, κακουργηματική απάτη σε βάρος του δημοσίου, κακουργηματική ψευδής βεβαίωση σε βάρος του δημοσίου. Όλα αυτά... Επισύουν ποινέ ισοβίων. Διότι όλοι αυτοί που μπαίνουν στην Ελλάδα, α αναφερθούμε και σε μερικά νομικά, παρότι ο ελληνικό λαό σήμερα δεν απαιτεί νομικέ συμβουλέ, απαιτεί λύσει και πολιτική κάθαρση. Όλοι αυτοί που μπαίνουν στην Ελλάδα δεν κάνουν καν αίτηση για, για άσυλο. Επομένω, είναι αυτομάτω λάθρο μετανάστε. Προσέξτε τον όρο, λάθρο μετανάστε. Όπω ακριβώ ορίζει και η απόφαση τη Συνόδου Κορυφή που υπογράψατε. Ο όρο αυτό λοιπόν, λάθρο μετανάστε, αφορά όλου αυτού την απόλυτη πλειοψηφία όσων βρίσκονται σήμερα στην Ελλάδα. Δεν πρέπει λοιπόν να μεταφέρονται στους περιβόητους χώρους φιλοξενίας. Είναι παράνομο, είναι κακουργηματική κατάχρηση εξουσίας να σπαταλάς εκατομμύρια ευρώ από το δημόσιο χρήμα για να σιτίζεις και να στεγάζεις πολυτελώς λαθρομετανάστες. Και γι' αυτό το έκλημα όταν η Χρυσή Αυγή αναλάβει τη διακυβέρνηση αυτής της χώρας, η υπέτη θα πληρώσει. 
on Islamic fascism, um, I have a slightly uh, dual role, I find, which is that in Europe, I preach uh, and talk pessimism, and in America, I preach and talk optimism. And um, there's a reason for that, uh, which is that it seems to me that the big thing that needs to happen at the moment is that Europeans wake up, but that Americans don't give up on Europe. I say that because um, Mark Stein, for instance, has just written a wonderful book, I'm sure many of you have read it, America Alone, which seems again to suggest that Europe is simply gone as a continent, that it's over, that it's so over over there. Um, Batyor, of course, um, a great scholar and a, a great writer, uh, came up with this term Eurabia, which has now gained currency in America, which is, I think, very worrying. People too routinely talk about Eurabia. It is still Europe, and if you start calling it Eurabia, if you believe that this is the case, I do worry that you're going to give up on us. I do worry you're going to give up on the good people of Europe who are still there. So please, avoid that temptation and avoid the schadenfreude of thinking they've mucked up again, we're not going to help, we need you now. Um, <laughs> the situation in Holland is um, desperately worrying. There's no doubt about that. Demographics, for one, are against us. Um, more than half of the children in Amsterdam schools are non-Dutch at the moment. Rotterdam is about to have a Muslim majority. The four largest cities in the Netherlands are predicted to have Muslim majorities in the next decade. The Dutch government in 2004 released a survey which said that by 2017, the majority of people in Holland would be non-Dutch. As Gerd Wilders said, an MP in the Dutch parliament, we will lose our country, it's as simple as that. And when people say, uh, why should we bother, why should we care about this, it's only Holland or something like this, I would suggest this. Many people, particularly conservatives, like to come up with the phrase, well, at least it won't happen in my lifetime. This will happen in our lifetimes. This isn't a distant future. Eleven years, ladies and gentlemen, eleven years till you lose the Netherlands. Um, two people who did wake up to this early were Pim Fortuyn and Ter Van Gogh, and of course both of them are now dead. Um, there are two speeches by both of these men which haunt me really, apart from anything else, because they provided a kind of um, very saddening prophecy of both of their demise. Uh, Pim Fortuyn gave a speech just a few months before his death when he left something called the Liberal Netherlands Party and founded his own party, which in four months um, got a, a, a sweeping victory in the elections without then it was their leader who was killed shortly before the election. Uh, Pim said when he left the Liefbaum Netherlands Party, uh, he gave a speech in which he said to his party, he said, I've kept my cool until now, but I won't hold it any longer. He said, it is five minutes to 12. It is five minutes to 12, not just in the Netherlands, but in all of Europe. That clock is still ticking, but without anything being done, it's just a little closer to midnight. When Ter Van Gogh uh, was still alive, just shortly before his death, he made a, uh, a speech, a characteristic speech of Van Gogh, in which he uh, appeared in Amsterdam dressed as an imam, and uh, he uh, had a strap-on false beard, uh, it was a sort of typically Van Gogh appearance, extremely tasteless but very funny as well, in which among other things he said that his so-called conversion to Islam uh, benefited him in two ways. He said first of all he found a religion uh, in which uh, women knew their place, <laughs> and secondly he'd found some clothes that fitted. Um, but Van Gogh finished that speech in 2004, shortly before his death, saying, he said, Allah is the scourge which will conquer Amsterdam. Sleep well, good Amsterdamers. The truth is that in the two years or to the month since Van Gogh was slaughtered on the streets of Amsterdam, the Dutch people and the Amsterdamers have indeed gone back to sleep. Largely a political problem, largely the fact that the right in Holland has split uh, without a leader since Fortuyn's death. They don't know who to back, where to go, turnout's been dropping, and uh, the parties that do exist, such as Wilders' party, have split and find no coherent voice. At the moment, as you also know, there, is a, there are a set of private tragedies going on from Holland. Ayan Hersjali, 
you'll know of, of course, no longer lives in Holland. One of the immigrants that Holland needed most left. Uh, Ayan Hersian, of course, now living in Washington. Um, Geert Wilders, her fellow MP, uh, lives under constant armed guard. Um, when he drives out, two motorcades go out, one decoy, uh, wherever he drives, uh, he can't campaign. There's an election in Holland this week. His, two of his supporters only two weeks ago were beaten up by Moroccans in Amsterdam putting up posters. The process of democracy, in other words, is becoming exceedingly dangerous. Young Dutch supporters of Wilders will not stand for his party, not because they don't support him, not because they don't have guts, but because they will have to have security protection for the rest of their lives if they stand as a candidate. That's a large amount to ask of a young man or woman starting out in a political career. Um, a friend of mine, Bachan Splat, a, um, a head of the only conservative think tank in Holland, the Burke uh, Institute, uh, it's a wonderful organization set up a few years ago, was told shortly before Van Gogh's death by the, the police in Holland that he should take uh, protection. Uh, he said, well, if I need protection, why will you not protect me? And he said, well, they, they said, well, there isn't enough money. Uh, but they suggested he paid for it himself uh, at the cost of 100 euros an hour, which, as you'll know, there's not that kind of money in think tanks. Um, so he went without protection until an hour after Van Gogh's death when the police were at his house and uh, whisked him away and gave him protection since. Afshin Elian, a great friend of mine, one of the great philosophers, I think, of Europe now, um, fled the Ayatollah Khomeini as a young man, fled to Afghanistan, where he then fled the Taliban and landed up in Holland, where he currently teaches at the University of Leiden, teaches law and philosophy, and he lives now under death sentence in Holland. Um, having th fled theo-fascism all his life, he's now encountered its worst form in Holland, where security guards sit on campus with him, the campus is searched for bombs every morning. Um, again, this is no life, and all that he has done is write newspaper columns fortnightly for a main conservative newspaper. Um, there are people who have stopped because they are so scared of what's going to happen. I know of journalists and others who simply stopped talking about uh, Islam. In one case, he went on television to read out his last newspaper column and said, leave me alone. I won't talk about Islam. I'll just continue teaching. Don't, don't hurt me. This is spreading across Europe, which is why it's important to tackle it now there. In Denmark, only a couple of weeks ago, we all have heard of the cartoons catastrophe. And incidentally, those people who tell you that, uh, and you hear them a lot, that there was something provocative about that. We should do the thought test. What could you do if you wanted to make a criticism of something that would be smaller than drawing a cartoon? Those people who say that we should have no truck with. But in Holland and Denmark, cartoons at the moment matter. Two weeks ago, a, Dutch, a group of, Dutch school, uh, sorry, of Danish school kids went on a kind of scout camp thing and demonstrating that humor isn't dead among the young of Denmark, uh, had their own mini cartoon competition. Uh, footage of this, filmed by someone, seems to be an infiltrator from another uh, political organization, filmed this and passed it to one of the main imams in Denmark who's just condemned by fatwa these young boys to death. Um, some of us are currently working at a fund to try to protect them, and I would very gladly pass on details if you're interested afterwards. Um, in Belgium, one of the MPs, Mouat Boussacle, lives uh, under death sentence, lives under protection. The AEL, which was mentioned just now in 2002, had effectively a Kristallnacht imitation pogrom in, uh, in Antwerp, uh, in which the head of the AEL, the uh, thug and Hezbollah trainee Dayed Abu Jaja, led chants in support of Osama bin Laden, the smashing up of Jewish owned shops, and then culminating in the chant, Hamas, Hamas, Allah, Yudan, Al Het Gas. Hamas, Hamas, all Jews to the gas. If we don't recognize these echoes now, I don't know when we will. In France, just a few weeks ago, as you'll know, Redica, a school teacher, um, has had to go into hiding after writing an article critical of Islam. Last two weeks ago, a German MP who spoke out, a Turkish immigrant MP who spoke out against the veil, was given death threats and now lives uh, under armed guard and in secure accommodation. And the truth is, this is simply spreading. It's even the case sometimes in the UK. I um, was invited by the uh, left-leaning newspaper, The Guardian, to write an article the other week explaining why I still support the Iraq war, uh, the bafflement and amazement they feel that uh, needs them to commission such articles. 
was evident. And um, in response just to that, among other things, there were um, suggestions posted up on the Guardian website that I should be beheaded. Um, and uh, one post said that I should be beheaded because only if I was beheaded would there be peace. I think it's a new movement, pacifists for beheading. Um, but uh, I, showed a, I showed submission, the Iron Herz Jalitur van Gogh film in public for the first time to group of MPs, peers and others a couple of weeks ago and had armed guards for that. So sadly it's spreading but there's no reason why we should step down or why we should be quieter or why we should stop. Um, the mosque, which Melanie just mentioned, the Tabliki mosque, the Tabliki have a metaphor for how they're going to spread. They say that they put out the tentacles into Europe. They will put out the leads of all these light bulbs across Europe. All the strands will go out and then Allah will turn on the lights. I suggest to you that if that light and those lights start to come on, the light of Europe will go out. But Europe is reawakening. And this is why I say do not be pessimists, do not sign up for Schadenfreude, and do not abandon this. Um, there are many movements in Europe at the moment, political and literary, to stop this. Just in the last few months, there's a new magazine started up in, in France, a superb magazine countering this, called um, Le Demain du Monde. Uh, do get it. Uh, Pinio, a new Dutch magazine starting up next month in Holland. Um, there's a new publishing house in Italy, new newspapers in Italy. Across Europe, there is, a, there is a strong and I hope more and more connected movement of MPs, representatives, journalists and others who are standing up to this threat. And they are saying without any compunction and bravely, I think, in many of their cases, if you want Sharia law, you can go and have it, but it will not be here. It will not be in our lands. We have to be better at giving out that message and I hope that you Americans will continue to support us as we say these things. Um, the UK, my own country, um, has uh, in recent years, as you know, stood absolutely shoulder to shoulder with your country and our troops fight daily beside yours in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, the British government and many of the British people I'm very proud of that. And it reminds me of, uh, I'll finish here, but it reminds me of one of my favorite stories, really, of one of the greatest men, Winston Churchill, who in 1940, when Britain was still standing alone against the threat of fascism last time, uh, Churchill invited the American ambassador to St. the court of St. James uh, to discuss your country um, providing provisions to uh, Britain in our darkest hour. And Winston Churchill, over a whole course of a weekend, persuaded your ambassador um, that he should uh, give provision, military and so on, to Britain. And at the end of the weekend, uh, when the ambassador was flying back to see the president that night, and he said, um, he said to Churchill, I wonder if you'd be interested in knowing what I'm going to say to the president. And Churchill agreed that he would like to know. And uh, the ambassador simply quoted from the second book of Ruth, uh, the first book of Ruth, the second chapter, I'm sorry, and just said to Winston Churchill then, he said, this is what I'm going to say. He said, whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I shall lodge also. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And then he said, added, even to the end. You kept that pact then. We've kept it in the last five years. And I hope that you'll find it to continue keeping that pact in the years ahead. Thank you.